Uh, welcome. Delighted to see you all here this afternoon. Um, the first um, pedal research seminar of uh, our second year, and in th this occasion jointly with um, psychology and education. Um, I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome uh, Nancy Perry today. She's come all the way from uh, Vancouver in British Columbia, especially. <laughs> <laughs> be with us today. I think you maybe had one or two other things on the <laughs> parts of the world. Um, as many of you will know, Nancy has been an inspiration um, and a leading uh, light and researcher in the area of self-regulation and young children's development for um, probably more years than she'd like to <laughs> admit. Um, and certainly was one of the researchers that inspired me to become interested in this particular area. And one of the great strengths of Nancy's work, which makes it particularly appropriate that she's talking to us in a faculty of education, is that she has always worked very much with teachers and with teachers as co-researchers. And that, as you can see, is very much related to her topic um, today. So I'm sure we're in for a, a very interesting, uh, thoughtful and stimulating uh, address. Nancy's going to talk for about an hour and then there will be about half an hour at the end for questions. Um, and there will, you will also have noticed some refreshments arise, arriving. So do please, at the end, if you would wish to have a bit of cake or a cup of tea or something while you chat to Nancy or to others um, at the end of the seminar. OK, so welcome. And um, I'll hand over to Nancy. I'm sure she's going to give us a very stimulating talk. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, David, and I'm very pleased uh, to be here. I've had an opportunity this afternoon to talk uh, with a number of David's colleagues in the PEDAL um, Center who are doing work through the PEDAL Center, and that's exciting to hear what's going on um, with that group. Um, I am this afternoon also uh, comforted, I think, by the universalness of nobody sitting in the front rows. <laughs> I think that happens everywhere. Where I, that's right. <laughs> that's where it happens where I am as well. Um, well, so I'm going to try and finish up my talking by 5.30, so I'll, I'll just get going. Um, my uh, research agenda, as David says, has been for now it is 20 plus years. Um, focused really on classrooms and uh, understanding how it is that uh, they can support children's uh, development of self-regulation. And a main thrust for me has always been how can researchers and teachers work together to support self-regulations in classrooms and schools. And so it's really exciting for me to see after this number of years and working in this area that this question is something that many researchers are asking. And I know um, certainly faculty here, Sarah and David and others, are working cooperatively, collaboratively um, with teachers in the research enterprise. I think, I, I firmly believe that that is probably the only way that we're going to see um, the uptake of our ideas and our research findings um, to the extent that, that we might like. Um, so this afternoon, uh, I am going to share with you a couple of uh, projects that I have on the go at the moment um, and look at how it is that I've uh, used participatory frameworks um, as a kind of global uh, uh, description of uh, uh, working with teachers um, to accomplish uh, my goal, my research goal. So this afternoon, I want to briefly, before going into the details of projects, um, ground my work in a little bit of self-regulated learning theory and research. Um, I don't want to go into a great deal of detail in that regard. I think probably the people in this room are pretty familiar with it. Um, but I'll just give you a little bit of a sense of where I stand on some of those uh, topics. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, current educational and research contexts that I think are really welcoming uh, to those of us who are doing work on self-regulated learning. And uh, also give a couple of examples from two projects. 
and finish up with talking a little bit about what I perceive to be um, next steps and hopefully um, invite a little bit of conversation and even collaboration if you're interested. So in terms of theoretical um, and research principles, I guess the first thing to uh, ask or for me to tell you is where, what is self-regulated learning uh, from my point of view? And I now, uh, I used to use uh, Barry Zimmerman's uh, definition before now, but now I use a definition that was given to me by uh, a group of grade one, two, and three children whose teacher um, asked them to come up with an explanation for what self-regulated learning is. And so they said it's the ability to do your job without having to be told, shown, or asked. Um, and uh, I think that's a pretty good um, representation of what the researchers have spent many years um, trying to determine. Uh, this is kind of the classic definition that uh, Barry Zimmerman gives um, for self-regulated learning. And uh, I guess we can say, you know, especially for young children, um, but I think for all of us, um, there's a great deal of focus on attending to the key features in the environment, um, learning how to resist distractions, um, persisting when you're challenged is a really key element, and responding adaptively and flexibly um, in situations uh, and, and contexts. So self-regulation in any domain uh, involves metacognition, motivation, and strategic action. And finally, self-regulated learners are proactive in their efforts to learn. They're aware of their strengths and weaknesses. They're guided by personally set goals and task-related strategies. So those are kind of some of the key elements I think of when I think about um, self-regulated learning and self-regulated learners. A couple of kind of key principles that um, I uh, kind of use in, in my research or to frame my research are the idea that self-regulation is a significant source of achievement differences. We know that um, from, a num from several decades now of, of research in the area. And uh, I, I should say I apologize, the first two uh, slides are a bit text heavy. Um, just so that I can get my points out, and then I assure you they become more interesting <laughs> after that. Um, and I can't even read them off the, off the uh, projector. My eyes aren't that good anymore. Um, but self-regulation is a developmental process. Um, so the good news about that is that it's malleable, and it can be nurtured, um, it can be learned. And uh, for those of you that have interest in uh, exceptional learners, uh, as I have a background in working with uh, students in, who have special education needs and other kinds of um, diverse needs. Um, children with exceptional learning needs can improve their self-regulated learning as well. Self-regulation supports personal but also social forms of learning. And I think in recent years we've had a great deal of focus on um, the social aspects of self-regulated learning or how it is that um, children need to be self-regulating in order to be successful in social situations. Um, so we've had work on co-regulation, which uh, that's a lot of what I see when I'm working in uh, particularly elementary school classrooms. Um, socially shared regulation, so the idea of uh, children working together collaboratively regulating um, one another. And um, a term that uh, one of my students coined in her dissertation research, a notion she refers to as socially responsible self-regulation. And that's the idea that I need to be um, self-regulating in a social situation in order to support not only my own learning, but your learning. So it's the idea that children um, need to be not only aware of their own strengths and weaknesses, but they also need to have a little bit of the ability to take other people's perspectives. Um, they need to know or read social cues and understand how it is that they can support others in a learning context and be sensitive to those things in order to be successful. Uh, 
I think there is, there's some research coming out. I think research across cultures and research in um, groups uh, such as low SES groups and so on in the area of self-regulation <coughs> is limited. There hasn't been a lot. Most of the research has um, been done in fairly um, typical kinds of populations, but there is some work uh, coming. I think that, that research is growing now, which is a good thing. And uh, other people's research and also the work that we're doing is uh, demonstrating that self-regulation is an asset that cuts across socio-demographic um, boundaries. So whether you're from a more disadvantaged uh, environment, whether, you know, whatever culture you're from, self-regulation is something that you can, it tends to be a protective factor. Um, it still predicts your success across a number of uh, settings and situations. And well-known models of self-regulated learning tend to be cyclical. So um, we're probably all familiar with the Winnie and Hadman um, uh, model or of self-regulation, Zimmerman, and also my colleague Deborah Butler at UBC has proposed a cyclical um, model of self-regulation. So they describe what learners do before, during, and after any kind of learning engagement. How it is that learners identify what's, what, they, what is their job, as the grade one, two, and three uh, students say, and then plan for action, try some strategies, monitor, self-evaluate, um, make adjustments as they go through um, the process. So, uh, given all of that, um, I want to just take a minute to uh, think a little bit about our global uh, context and then to tell you a little bit about my own context in British Columbia that makes me really optimistic about um, bringing self-regulated learning to classrooms at this particular point in time. Um, so I think in the global context, we have a great emphasis on 21st century learning skills. And if you look at the writings about those skills, there's a lot in there that really connects with what we um, believe about self-regulated learning. The idea that um, learners are going to need to be adaptive, flexible, creative, problem solvers, right? Um, they're going to need to be continuously learning, lifelong learners. Um, I love this quote by Dumont et al. Um, who say we're preparing learners for jobs that do not yet exist using technologies that haven't been invented and solving problems that haven't yet been recognized as problems. And so if you take that all together, it really, I think, emphasizes the need to be developing self-regulating learners. Similarly, in uh, British Columbia, we are in the process of implementing a new curriculum and uh, the Ministry of Education has recognized through their, that curriculum that there's a, we really need to be emphasizing um, personalized learning. And by that, they're getting at this notion that it, we can't assume as educators that a one-size-fits-all is going to capture the diversity of the student population in our schools. Um, so we need to be individualizing learning, but we also need to be giving students more ownership over their learning, helping them to develop um, the strategies for taking control and being in control of their learning. Um, and to not only be differentiating in terms of um, academic or skills-based, but also in terms of students' interests, their motivational um, interests and giving them opportunities. So personalized learning is intended to capture all of that. There's also a great emphasis, like I think there are in many um, regions, uh, on inquiry learning, formative assessment, um, inclusion, uh, approaches to inclusion. And again, for me, I just see lots of opportunities in those kinds of educational innovations to be using self-regulation and self-regulated learning frameworks. So um, I think my message uh, for teachers and uh, people involved in education is just that these, that self-regulated learning um, frameworks can both benefit um, from and support self-regulation uh, in schools. Okay, 
So now, thinking a little bit about, there's the kind of educational context, I want to look a little bit now at the research um, context. And I think for researchers, um, that educational context, self-regulation has never been more relevant um, to, uh, to what's going on in schools. And there's more talk than ever about the role that research should play in improving education. Um, and I think that's a real shift for the research uh, community. And it's certainly something that's welcome um, to me. But the question for us, and a, always a little bit of a challenge, is how it is that we can give our science away. We haven't always been very successful, and I can speak for educational psychologists, about speaking to educational communities in ways that resonate um, with them. Uh, and so I think that's kind of where our, our struggle um, has been, needs to be. Um, I think we often ask, you know, why is it that this kind of bounty of knowledge that we have just doesn't get implemented as much as we think perhaps that it should be? Why aren't our evidence-based practices adopted and sustained in practice? Um, well, I have some ideas about that, um, and it seems like others do as well. Um, we might ask ourselves uh, whether the way we pursue the development of these practices exacerbates the research to practice gaps. Um, is it that we make our research a little bit too inaccessible um, for educators? Um, are we researching the things that really matter to them? Um, are we involving them and so on? So my colleague, Joe Luzician, is, uh, Joe's at UBC as well, and he's looking at this issue. And he um, distinguishes between kind of the traditional uh, three approaches to um, research, particularly in educational psychology. We tend to do efficacy studies, effectiveness studies, and dissemination studies. Now, in terms of thinking about those, the efficacy studies tend to investigate practice under ideal conditions. And this is kind of Joe's thinking about why it is we might not be making the inroads that uh, we would like to. Um, so our efficacy studies are in ideal conditions, which may not speak to practical or practice uh, conditions. Um, effectiveness studies investigate practice under real conditions. So that gets a little bit closer um, to, the, to the classroom context. And dissemination studies investigate whether practices can be implemented large scale by practitioners in real world conditions. But according to Joe, the problem is that there's lots of efficacy studies. We tend to do a lot of those. There are fewer effectiveness studies and there are very, it's very rarely the case that we in education do these large-scale dissemination studies. Um, so it seems like we need to, to do something about that. A different kind of approach, one that I have uh, been using throughout my work, and it's not, I mean, we think about um, you know, participatory frameworks. Maybe they're being used more widely now. But in fact, if you look back, action research and so on does date back um, to the 1940s and so on. There were um, people doing that. And so um, it's not completely new, but it is the less traditional route to go, uh, certainly in the field of self-regulated learning. Um, but these approaches have been referred to variously as action research, communities of practice, collaborative inquiry. And I'm referring to them in my work now as teacher learning teams just because the teachers that I work with, that kind of resonates with them and that's the terminology that, that they're um, using. But it tend, it's the case that the approach generally has the goal of engaging teachers in cycles of inquiry, which fits very nicely. They're not so different from cycles of self-regulated learning. Um, they involve teachers in planning, enacting, reflecting on their practice. And the goal 
is to have teachers generate knowledge. So not just receive information from the outsider who is supposed to be the expert, but rather the teachers become central in the whole process of generating knowledge about teaching and learning that they can then use to develop and implement effective practices in their classrooms. Um, so I like to think that maybe we're recognizing more and more that with our research and our interventions and so on, it's not that there's a one size fits all, but rather we need to have research um, practices and principles that are robust enough to stand the test of real uh, contexts, not, not just the ideal contexts. And also to recognize that teaching and learning uh, environments are unique all around. So for one teacher, uh, the, the context in which she's working and the way in which an evidence-based practice might work in her classroom is not the same as for another teacher. So there needs to be more flexibility, I think, in the ways in which we think about things like fidelity of implementation, issues of generalizability, and so on. So with all of that, I read um, with great interest a small piece in the Educational Researcher earlier this year um, by Colburn and Panul, um, who have been engaged in design-based research for some time. Um, but the, the piece that they wrote, and you may want to look at it after we finish today, really resonated with me in terms of the work that I do. And so they were talking in that piece about <coughs> research practice partnerships. And they defined them as long-term collaborations between researchers and practitioners that address mutual interests and goals. That's kind of a critical part of it. It's not the researcher coming in with their agenda or coming in to tell practitioners how to make, how to improve practice. Rather, it's the two of them working together to think about that. Um, they focus on problems of practice and they involve iterative cycles of, of uh, planning, enacting, and reflecting. Um, the benefits, it seems, for practitioners, and this was what um, Colborn and Panul emphasized, was that it increases or it potentially makes the research a little more accessible if you're working in partnership. Um, and that, hopefully, would increase the use of research for making practice and policy decisions. Um, the interventions, hopefully, would be more usable and therefore more sustainable. And finally, they felt that the idea of increasing capacity in systems and stakeholders to engage in research improved, uh, informed improvements would accrue from a more partnership approach to doing research. Um, I would add to that that for researchers, one of the benefits of working this way is that you get a much deeper commitment from um, the, the teachers and the participants. Um, and also, you get this wonderful opportunity to test theory in naturalistic contexts, which should lead to more robust and practical models of self-regulated learning. So I think, again, the benefits are mutualistic in this kind of partnership. So now I want to move to talking a little bit. I've brought just a couple of examples from um, two projects that I have been working on. One is a longitudinal study of children's development of self-regulated learning, and we've been following a cohort of uh, students in one of the school districts uh, in my area for the past um, two years. We picked them up, picked up children at the end of their kindergarten year, and we've followed them so far through grade one and grade two. So I'll just give you a little bit of a sense of the design of the study. Um, what we did, and I should say that uh, having done, you know, um, 15 or 16 years of participatory work with teachers, I decided that I was going to do a really classical longitudinal study. And so I designed it and I got funding for it, um, but I couldn't get teachers to participate in it. <laughs> because they weren't going to be engaged, the professional learning wasn't going to come until after the study, of course. I didn't want to mess up the controls, right? 
Um, but I couldn't get anybody to participate. So I had to change um, my design and respond to uh, teachers' um, wish that they want, if they're going to participate in research, and I don't know if this is the case where you are, they want it to be, um, they want to get something out of it. They want to have some professional learning come from their experience. Um, so basically what we have is we've identified this cohort of uh, children. We call them the kindergarten. Oh. What age group is this? They, in, sorry, that's a very good question. They would be five, so I think it's your reception class. Yes, yes, it's their first year. Um, and so yes, we, we have uh, the kindergarten cohort. Even now they're in grade two, they're still referred to as the kindergarten cohort. Um, but so what we did was we said, well, even teachers in grade one and two, they can start with us at the beginning of the study because they're going to have the kindergarten cohort. Um, and so we thought we'll get them involved. And the other um, strategic uh, idea about that was really when you're doing a longitudinal study, you need schools to commit for some period of time. And it's not good enough to just know that you've got the kids in kindergarten if their grade one and two teachers are not going to be willing to continue um, the project. And so we involved all the teachers from the start. Um, we had, I, I think, 50 plus um, teachers involved and we have um, seven schools in the area and of course that's nested within a school district that really is very supportive of a self-regulating approach to teaching and learning, wants their teachers to be getting professional learning on that topic. Um, so we were working in a, in a situation that was quite um, supportive. Um, we have collected data over these two uh, years. Um, we have kindergarten, but it's really the end of kindergarten that we collected the first wave of, uh, of data. And we are involved in three different, uh, mainly three kinds of activities. One is to engage teachers in professional learning teams, and I'm going to talk, that's going to be kind of the, what comes from that is going to be the focus of what I present for you today. Um, but we also visit classrooms between our learning team meetings. So the learning teams meet three times over the course of the year, um, and we visit classrooms between those visits. Um, and we involve teachers in the data collection, so helping us to sample students' work um, in the classrooms. So this just gives you a sense of who is in the cohort um, over the K to one years. You can see that we have a little bit of attrition, but not um, too bad. Um, and that the teachers in the uh, fourth column there are the teachers of the kindergarten cohort. So I haven't included there the, the other teachers that would be around, but we did have, um, for example, some of the kindergarten teachers who stayed with the project even through grade two, even though they weren't, they were no longer teaching the kindergarten cohort. Um, and we do go into those classrooms and observe what those teachers are doing. So we not only have kind of longitudinal data on children's development, we also have teacher development over time. Um, and I should note that we do have some number of classrooms or schools that are French um, in, in usually the children who are um, attending those classrooms, they're in a French immersion, so they're, learn they're French language learners um, in that case. Um, we have uh, a quite diverse um, group of uh, students. You can see that families reported more than 56 individual cultures um, and that the schools represent the full range of uh, SES um, communities. This just kind of elaborates on the research activity. So as I said, um, the learning teams meet three times over the course of the year, kind of once each uh, term. Um, and then researchers visit classes in between those uh, learning team meetings. And during those visits, we keep a running record so that we have an observation of what's going on in the classroom. And we usually follow that by a debriefing interview. And again, this was something that teachers asked for because they didn't want us just coming into their classrooms and observing and thank you very much and off you go. 
Rather, they wanted, they wanted feedback. Now, we don't want to give them feedback, but what we've come up with is a little bit of a debriefing questionnaire that gets them, that really asks them, what were your goals for this? What were you trying to accomplish? And how do you think that it went? Um, and just to have a little bit more of a discussion, and even by virtue of having those kinds of conversations, I think teachers often figure out things or things occur to them, or even with us, we can use the time to clarify um, their purposes and so on. And so I think they've been quite satisfied with that. Um, we also, when we go to visit in the classrooms, uh, that's the time when we collect samples of, student, of children's work so that we can connect what teachers are doing with what we're seeing in terms of students and their, their self-regulated learning. Um, and finally, at the end of each school year, we have teachers rate children's uh, self-regulated learning using an instrument that, again, Linda Hutchinson, my student, developed for um, her dissertation. So in the partnership, researchers have questions. So we definitely, we have a study that we want to do and we have questions that we want um, to have answered and we're having opportunities to answer those questions. But we're also emphasizing to, student, to teachers that they also should have questions. And their questions, we have this shared goal together of supporting students in their development of self-regulated learning. Um, but teachers in their own classrooms may feel that they have areas in which they need to focus that are unique to their particular classroom. Um, and we're using, uh, I should have had, uh, it's uh, Linda Kayser and Judy Halbert have developed what they refer to as a spiral of inquiry. And it's just a, a process for collaborative inquiry and so we have borrowed that. But essentially it has teachers, as you can see, beginning to scan and consider, first of all, what's going on for your learners? And where does your focus need to be? So we have this general focus together, but your focus may need to be um, somewhere else or somewhere more specific. And then each time they return to the learning team, we talk about what they've tried and has it made a difference and it, how do they know um, as questions that we want them to be answering for themselves. The other thing as researchers we've brought um, to, the, to the partnership is uh, from my own work and uh, also building on other um, work, a set of categories that um, we refer to as kind of SRL promoting practices. And as you might guess, um, teachers, when you ask like what is their focus, what does their focus need to be, it's almost always what can I be doing um, to support children in their development of self-regulation. And so I'm not going to go through each of these um, individually. If you're familiar with my work, you'll be familiar with the categories. Um, but the five overarching things in terms of supporting self-regulated learning are, is this notion of giving students influence. So we want them to have ownership, but it's also really important that teachers provide a structure, not in a controlling way, but in a helpful way that gives students this, the, the knowledge, the tools that they need, um, and the support when they're, when they're struggling. Um, so that also is an important thing. So what are we getting for our efforts? Um, I'm going to give a couple of examples from teachers that we've been working with. Um, one, I'm just going to describe a year-long um, study of uh, Burns Bog that uh, she did with her grade two, three um, students. And uh, Burns Bog is in the school, in the area where, in the region where the school district is. So it's right in the student's neighborhood. Um, and uh, the, the goals for this uh, task, oops, sorry, not going fast enough here. Um, this teacher, with her students, she wanted them to be developing skills for scientific inquiry. So as, you, as I referred to the new curriculum, inquiry, there's a great emphasis on that. And so this was her um, focus, or one of her focus, foci. Um, 
And for science, one of the learning outcomes was that children should learn about a natural ecosystem. So this, in their neighborhood, gave a wonderful opportunity for them to learn about that. Um, including how plants and animals, and even humans, and she had a cultural component. So there are a lot of indigenous um, communities in the area, and so they looked at, you know, how have indigenous people um, used the bog um, over time and benefited from the bog. So what she did was she began with an essential question. So again, if you think about um, as the teacher learning team, we had a shared focus. She decided the class would have a shared focus. And that was, why is the bog important? So very open-ended, not specific. And they visited the bog. Um, on four separate occasions over the course of the year. And in the first visit, she told the students, just leave your papers, pencils, don't, don't want you to write down anything. We're just going to do a wonder walk. And when you come back, we're going to generate a list of all the things you were thinking about, wondering as you went through um, the walk. And it was from the wonder walk that the children then generated their personal inquiry questions so that each child had a focus, um, their own focus, uh, for the rest of the year. Um, well, I shouldn't say they stuck with a focus for the entire year because I think there was some movement across there and there were questions that they answered as a group as well as projects that students did um, on their own. Um, they observed changes in the bog from fall to winter. They investigated ecosystems in the spring and they did an art project in the style of Emily Carr. And I don't know, this will make sense maybe to David, but Emily Carr is part of a group of seven <coughs> artists that um, were very prominent uh, in British Columbia, um, so well known um, to, to uh, kids in British Columbia. I'll just throw up here. Here are some of the children's questions. Um, and remember, grades two, three. So I think um, some pretty interesting um, areas to, uh, to investigate. And over the course of the year, the teacher linked what they were doing with their study of the bog to various curricular areas. So you can see here in science, they looked at um, the food chain in the bog. And right up at the top, the bear is at the top of the food chain and it works its way all the way down to plants and, and insects and, and plants and so on. Um, they made a map of the bog along with a legend um, to show all the different places in the bog. They counted various things in the bog and graphed them and did different things with them in, in mathematics. And one day they took pastels and uh, paper, and they went to the bog, and they created, in the style of Emily Carr, their own um, pieces of artwork. And they wrote haiku poems about the bog. So the children used what they were learning in the bog to represent and represented their learning in a number of ways um, over the course of the year which, if you think about differentiating instruction, gives most children, uh, or gives children different ways into the um, task and different ways of demonstrating um, success. They might be more or less successful at particular tasks. Uh, and at the end of the year, they had a school-wide poster fair. And this particular division, um, made their posters about their inquiry project. And you can see that this one child, their question was, how did First Nations historically meet their needs in Burns Bog compared to how we do today? And so they looked at different ways in which the bog might have met um, needs for uh, medical needs, um, needs for clothing, for um, food, and so on. Um, lots of different things. And they also kept a learning journal in which they reflected on what was it that they were learning um, as they studied the bog. So just to kind of recap, how is it that such a task 
creates opportunities for children to develop as self-regulating learners. Well, again, if you um, are familiar with uh, my work, I've kind of emphasized this notion of tasks and how um, complex um, tasks or tasks that are complex by design in that they have multiple goals. You're trying to accomplish more than one thing. They're focused on something meaningful and they extend over time and they engage kids in different um, processes, a wide range of processes, and also lead to the production of different kinds of products that in those kinds of contexts, there are lots of opportunities for um, self-regulation. So certainly, I think we can agree that the burns Bog task was a complex task. Um, in terms of opportunities for self-regulation, it gives students choices. So they all had a choice about what their question, what kinds of things did they want to pursue in their study of the bog. Um, they had control over challenges often in the ways in which they would present their information or go about doing the work. Um, and we saw the evidence that they were engaged in self-assessment, at least in terms of doing the learning journal. So there was a lot of support for autonomy. And always lots of teacher um, and peer support. So those kinds of things we know lead to uh, success. Um, as a second example from this project, I just want to play a very short clip. For, um, and this is a movie that a teacher in the project made. Um, and she had adopted a program, and I'm always fearful of adopting programs <coughs> called Zones of Regulation. I don't know if this is something that is popular here. But it does have an emphasis on helping children to develop emotion um, regulation. But it tends to be something that teachers do for 15 minutes at the beginning of the day. And then it doesn't really relate to anything else that they're doing throughout the day. So you know, after kind of struggling with this, um, this teacher did find a way to kind of embed it in more than, than that and make it kind of, of meaningful. And this video is her talking through how she used the program and how she used it to support um, her students' self-regulated learning. So I'll just let her tell you. This, this is my zones of regulation board. There are four different zones, blue, green, yellow, and red. We would like the children to be in the green zone when they're at school. That helps us to be at our best. <coughs> but all of us have times when we're in the red zone, or the yellow zone, or the blue zone. So when the kids come in in the morning, they come and take their name tag, and they're at the bottom, you can see them, and they place it under the zone that tells about how they're feeling at that time. So after the kids have huddled around and put their name tag up, the board might look like this. It's a great visual for me because I can look over right away and see not all the kids are in the green zone. The name tag underneath the zone is an indication that I need to have a talk with someone. So I'd walk over to the board and I would say, Sebastian, why are you in the red zone today? Can you come and talk to me about that? And they would come over and we would have a conversation about how they're feeling. It's important to honor their feelings. For whatever it is, they're feeling in a certain way. And that's okay. We need to let them know that. We'd also talk about what is the size of the problem. Is it a huge problem or is it a small problem? We might look out over the class and see if everybody else is worried about the problem that they told me about. We might also say, do you think it's something that you can let go? Say you're disappointed about or say it's something you're angry about, but move yourself back into the green zone so that you could be your best at school today. Usually, the child will be able to move their name tag back into the green zone. But there are instances where they're not ready to move it, and that's okay. We would then talk about ways that they could take good care of themselves and their emotions. So here's a chart that we would go over three deep breaths, tight muscles, hand presses, finger pulls, hug yourself. Usually after that, they'll be able to move themselves over. But there have been times when it's taken a while for them to get their name out of that red zone and feel like their body is ready to be in the green zone. I would also have a conversation with the people that are in the yellow zone and the people in the blue zone. 
Sometimes we need to do some exercises to wake up, or we need to have a drink, or do something if we're not feeling very well. The reason why I love this board is, I might not know that Sebastian's feeling angry about something. He might have come in and sat at his desk if I didn't have this board. Right away, he's telling me that something's not right. That's my job to go and help him to learn to regulate his body so that he is able to have those feelings, but how to regulate them, take care of them, and move his body back into the green zone where it's best for learning. Okay. So what I like about that example is that the teacher is, the emphasis is on emotion regulation, but it's getting those emotions to a place where we're ready for learning, because that's why we're at school. We need to be, um, to be ready for learning, and I'm going to support you to get ready for learning. Okay, so all, I think, you know, those are great examples of kind of teachers um, doing wonderful things in terms of supporting students' self-regulated learning that I didn't even come up with as a researcher. They came up with those things. Um, so by giving them a framework for self and giving them a larger set of practices or principles, if you will, they have been quite successful in then translating that into practice in their particular context to suit um, the, the unique teaching and learning needs in their classroom. But I think there are some uh, challenges uh, that continue with this approach to research. Um, and uh, one of them, and these again come from Coburn and Panul, but I can resonate with them. There certainly is the issue of communication. So whenever researchers and teachers are working together, there's that negotiation um, that you have to engage in to develop a common language for de discussing concepts and issues. Um, it's also the case that oftentimes you're negotiating new roles and responsibilities. You know, teachers don't, aren't used to um, presenting themselves as experts. Uh, particularly to outsiders and, and to researchers. So that's new to them. And researchers, I guess, have to resist the temptation to always be the expert um, in any given situation. Um, there are also the organizational realities of educational systems. And we could go on at length about how those can either afford or constrain um, these kinds of partnerships. Um, <clears throat> but one of the things I think that uh, we have come across that um, Coburn and Panul ask the question, who is the partner? <laughs> and that is really an issue. Of course, we want to partner with teachers. But when you think, how do you get to teachers? Well, usually you have to go through a school board who then puts you in touch with principals, who then makes the decision whether their school is going to be involved or not and tries to get the teachers on board. And so as a researcher, when you get connected with those teachers, you're often in a situation where you're wondering, like, are you here because you really are invested and want to do that? And I think that's true a lot of the time, but I also think sometimes teachers um, feel like, well, this is, you know, the school-wide goal or this is, and so it's, it's sometimes, um, you know, you get less willing uh, participation. So then, of course, the challenge becomes, well, how do you bring them on board? How do you get them to kind of buy in um, to what it is that you're about? And I would honestly say that we've been very successful in some cases and not so successful in others. You saw we went from seven to six uh, schools. We had a whole school um, fallout. So that definitely uh, happens. Um, there's always going to be competing points of view and pressures. Um, and I think those of you who are working with teachers, it seems there's no shortage of things that they feel they have to do, um, pressures that are, that are on them. Um, and then, of course, there's a great deal of turnover. So for our longitudinal project, even though we tried to get schools to make that commitment for the kids through grade two, at the end of every school year, you can have turnover of principals at school, or you can have turnover of teachers in schools. And so now you're getting in touch with a grade one teacher who was not in the school when the commitment was made, 
um, to these kids, and so they may or may not want to participate in your study. I have to say, I used to be quite um, harsh on longitudinal studies when they would come across my desk as a reviewer, and now I have great respect for anybody who <laughs> tries to do this work because it's not, uh, it's not simple. Um, I'll just quickly uh, talk about the second project um, as a partnership. And uh, it's a different kind of partnership. It's an after-school um, music education uh, program that we're working with. Um, and the program, I'll tell you a little bit about the context, um, it's located in what's referred to as Vancouver's downtown east side. And this is the poorest postal code in all of Canada. Um, so you can imagine that there are some challenges that, uh, that accrue to that. If you're familiar with um, the Il Sistema um, music program that originated in Venezuela, um, and their notion that there should be music education for everybody. And also the goal, not just to educate people about music, but really to um, provide a social um, experience for uh, children through music education. Uh, so transformation through music education. Um, so children who attend the program, they have to be children who live and attend school in the neighborhood. Um, and that may seem like a no-brainer, but you would be surprised. The teachers um, in this program are professional musicians, most of them, who play with our symphony orchestra or part of jazz groups or independent um, musician or but professionals. Um, and they get an incredible education. They come to the school uh, three to five days a week. Um, after school, they're fed uh, a meal, and then they go into um, three or four hours of music education with four different blocks. So every child learns an instrument. Every child is part of the orchestra. They have junior and senior. Every child is part of chorus, junior and senior. And uh, um, they have music theory. So I don't know about you, but I didn't get a music education um, like that uh, as a child and probably could have benefited <laughs> quite a bit. So I think they're really privileged in that respect in terms of the kind of music education um, that they're receiving. Um, but they come from diverse cultural and linguistic um, communities. There are children with high abilities and there are children with disabilities. They don't um, say no to any child uh, just on the notion of having a disability. So they have children who are on the autism spectrum. Um, they have children also who may have experienced uh, fetal alcohol syndrome or effects. Lots of different uh, challenges in that way. Um, and almost all the children, by definition, are facing various kinds of adversity. So challenging um, context. The other thing is that teachers are musicians. So most of them have no formal teacher education or preparation. And what's interesting about this group in terms of partnership, I would say in the first project, it was definitely me reaching out to the district to find a partner. In this case, they reached, the, the community reached out to us and said, we're in, you know, we hear you do work on self-regulation. We'd be interested in knowing what that's about. And so they invited me to come down and just make a presentation about what this is and why I thought it was important. And afterwards, many teachers came up and they said, oh my gosh, like this just resonates with, I can just see so much of what you're saying in the children that we're working with. And I think this could be really good for us. And so it was out of that kind of um, interaction at first that we formed a teacher learning team at the Music Academy. And uh, interestingly, the teachers that have been working with us there have been a very stable, kind of consistent group, and we're in our third year of working with them um, now. So the activities, um, well, you can see we have 18 uh, teachers plus five staff, so that's the director and kind of coordinators and, and so on, um, collaborating. Um, and 18 teachers, that would be about 50% of their teachers. So it's not everybody, um, and it's clear that the teachers have a choice about whether they're participating. But what's interesting is that we have been increasing 
our numbers of teachers every year. Um, because, and I think part of it is that choice. So you get the people who are really invested and committed, and when they start to feel success or see success, the word spreads and more people um, come on board. Um, there are over 250 children enrolled in the program, so you can imagine if you're, and if these teachers, the kids are rotating across teachers. So having 18 teachers, you can have a lot of impact probably on those. But what we said to teachers at the start was, what, just to make this manageable for you, why don't you focus on one child or a small group of children that you feel, you know, if you could make a difference for that person, it would really change things in your context um, and for them. Um, and so we've been focusing on uh, some specific children. We've also implemented, again, from them, the director said, gee, I really would love to have like some of the children in the senior um, group mentoring some of the children in the junior group. Um, it would give them a sense of leadership, and so on. we thought, oh, that's great. So one of my students worked with her. They designed a peer cross-age peer mentoring program, and he um, got a master's thesis out of it as well. Um, but uh, he started small, and now this year that will be expanded. I think that's another lesson we learned, is if you start small, think big. Um, you often can be you know, accomplish kind of much more. We've created with them a website which is full of resources for teachers. It's a place uh, where they share what it is that they're doing, but it also gives information out to families if they're interested, and just general resources and information about self-regulation. And we send a newsletter um, to families at least once a year, sometimes twice a year, just to update them on what it is that we're doing. And we're involved with their development officer, and so we've worked together to raise funds to do the research and to support um, the program. So from a partnership point of view, you can see how um, this kind of structure is probably going to create something that's a lot kind of stronger and more stable than the other way that I've, I've gone about it. So um, I'm learning too. Um, and you can see here that we follow a lot of the same uh, kinds of activities in terms of the teacher learning teams, the classroom visits with debriefs. Um, we also, from, in terms of hearing from the children and youth, we have, instead of paper and pencil tasks that are kind of traditional in school-based research, we've instead followed a photo elicitation strategy where we've given the children cameras and asked them to take pictures of times in the program when they're feeling successful or like they are in control of their learning and so on. And then we collect their pictures, videos, whatever it happens to be, and they use a program uh, bookmaker in, on an iPad to create their SJMA story. Um, and then we use their narratives, we code their narratives to see whether we're meeting our goals of um, supporting self-regulation and self-determination um, in this particular context. Um, I'm going to finish up here uh, in just a few minutes, but just to kind of show you too how the, the teachers in this um, program, again, came up with their own definitions of self-regulation and then developed their own um, cycle of self-regulation to build in kind of the music um, thing. But they also, they talk about self-regulating musicians as practicing <coughs> musicians and interesting to have them talk with us about what it means to practice. Because oftentimes you think, and they say that, you know, if you ask children to practice, they just go through it over and over and over again. But a musician will not go through it over and over and over again. They focus on specific things and specific parts, and they work on one thing until they get it, and then they add something else. And so the, the notion of strategy and being strategic and so on, really they can resonate. I think that's the other thing about the partnership, is that we know nothing about music, most of us. Um, they are the experts about music. We couldn't do this without them. Um, and we bring the information about self-regulation and self-regulated learning. The other thing is that you know, we have the shared purpose. Um, and they really have worked to make it program-wide and to do things that will make it um, obvious to others in the program. So they have a bulletin board in a central space where they display different things about self-regulation as they go. Okay, I'm going to flip forward. I was going to uh, show you just one example 
of a teacher's inquiry in this context, but I think it's a fabulous example like the others that I showed you. Um, what's interesting is that it, the focal student in the project was a student who was on the autism spectrum who had a lot of difficulties working in social groups. And, uh, but the teacher, who was the music theory teacher, it was really important to him to work with the children in groups. And so his entire inquiry was, um, first of all, he didn't know much about autism, and he didn't know much about um, supporting children to uh, be respectful and, and so on. And so he worked very hard, and uh, at the end of the day, this child wrote the lyrics for a piece, and the teacher worked with the class to develop the music to go with it, and they all played it at the spring concert. And here is the child at the end of the concert feeling fairly good. Um, and so what did the teachers say about their experience? Lots of good things, but I really like this comment at the bottom. It says, this project has radically shaped my experience of teaching at the music program. I would have been too discouraged to continue after two years on my own. So um, a good feeling in terms of if you, are we making a difference or is the project making a difference? Uh, so what's next? I'm not going to go into great detail about that, but just to say that uh, we are continuing, as I said, into the third year at the music school. And this year is probably going to be our last because I think they won't need us after that. Um, and so the focus is really on building capacity. And when I go back the day after I return, and this is the, on their initiative, they're holding a Pro-D day in which they're now developing a scope and sequence that's going to be not only curricular um, in terms of music, but also embedding self-regulated learning and supports for social-emotional learning um, in their context. For the longitudinal study, we have been fortunate to get four more years of funding. And so now we have the opportunity to follow the kindergarten cohort through grade six. So that's really exciting. And uh, we are expanding um, so that it's not just in our context, but we have a number of um, research sites and uh, collaborators in Canada. And also David is a collaborator, and we're hoping that some of the folk in the fetal uh, community here will, will be interested in, in working with us. Um, and we have four um, foci that just kind of to address the challenges that we've experienced. So um, one of the things you'll notice, we've been collecting children's work samples, but it's kind of like apples and oranges across, ta or across classrooms. So one of our goals is to work with teachers still, finding out from teachers what kinds of tasks they would want us to be looking at, um, but having them come together, so the group of grade three teachers to decide on a particular task and working together to design those more system, so that we have a more systematic assessment of children's self-regulated learning at the end of a school year. Um, we're gonna focus on children who are at risk in their development of self-regulation, so honing in on the, that group. Um, adding to our sample, and uh, expanding our model of teacher professional learning um, and studying that more systematically. I think we've learned things from the St. James Music Academy context that we can bring into um, this other context. So, in conclusion, I think we're making some headway uh, in closing the research um, to practice gap for SRL. Um, and it's interesting to think, we always think in terms of that theory to practice, but certainly in my work, I would be nowhere in my theory if I didn't have access to good practitioners as I have had um, over the past few years. So I think that is something that goes both ways. Um, and we need to recognize that as researchers. Um, question, are we making enough of a difference? Well, that's something that uh, we might talk about or discuss um, and uh, uh, and I guess you know in terms of scale and so on um, that's a question that is reasonable to to ask uh, but are we making enough difference for teachers and also for learners I think we're still analyzing the data I think we've got some data that will help us to answer those questions um, we'll need to look at it um, we're still grappling with challenges of research <coughs> standards things like fidelity or generalizability or scale 
Um, but I guess I'm comfortable working in a more situated, um, contextual kind of way because I'm not convinced um, that the ways in which we have att paid attention to fidelity, for example, are necessarily useful if we want to bring our work into schools and that maybe we need to have a more flexible um, notion where fidelity is not necessarily to the very specific aspects of an intervention to a more, but to a more global set of principles or understandings about um, a field. So that's just one um, example. We can pursue those kinds of things in a conversation. Sorry, you've been very uh, patient. I'll finish there and uh, enjoy talking with you for a few minutes. just before um, or when you were running through the conclusions. What are your thoughts at this point about scalability for research practice partnerships? I'd love to hear some of the suggestions or, or things you've been working on in your team. Well, I think scalability, it, it's a lot about funding, right? Um, to afford that kind of scale in, in research. Um, but it also is a lot about practice practicalities as well. So again, I'm just not convinced that, well, I mean, I would say, um, you know, I think if you could, if, for example, I was involved, you know, I was involved in an initiative in, that was province-wide, and the initiative was called Changing Results for Young Readers. And so that was the superintendent of our ministry, uh, one of the superintendents in our ministry of education, um, was committed to improving things in terms of reading for all kinds of children who were not learning to read for various reasons. And she included kind of three themes in the initiative. One was self-regulated learning, one was social-emotional learning, and the other was um, Aboriginal ways of knowing. Um, and she had an expert resource team, um, expert, that was, I was part of that, um, but she involved learning teams all over the province. So every school district in the province, that was 60 some, had a teacher learning team and on the teacher learning team they had to have, I think, representation from at least four different schools and for each school she required that they bring their um, special education uh, teacher and the principal. Um, and these people met six or seven times across a school year. Um, and she did it for three years running, different learning teams every So if you can get your ministry, I mean, that brings something to scale. And there was a researcher, and we collected data um, about it. So that's one way of getting it to scale. <laughs> and it was the same kind of thing where we had some shared foci. We were bringing some information to teachers about not only just how to support reading instruction, but how you can help children to just be successful learners. Um, and attend to some of their social emotional problems that might interfere with their learning. Um, so bringing those kind of general guidelines, but then every teacher on the teacher learning team um, identified their own focus as well. Where does your focus need to be um, in your classroom? And asking them questions like, you know, when they came back and were trying things, is what you're doing making a difference? And how do you know? I mean, those are important questions, I think. That really, and it's helpful for teachers to think in those terms. So, so I think that's one way to bring things to scale if you can get the support for it. Yeah. Complex yeah. answer to a complex. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes. Jenny. Hi. Thanks for a um, great talk. I'm Jenny Gibson, one of the researchers in the Pedal Centre. I was really interested in how the funders respond to the fact that your main outcomes are not around academics, that you're focusing on self-regulated learning and not literacy improvement, for example. Yeah. Well, that's a good question. Um, one that the reviewers, I'm, 
I, I guess when we're looking at the student outcomes, we are looking at the extent to which um, ch uh, teachers' ratings of students' self-regulation and also um, coming up, the kinds of tasks that we'll have kids engaged in for self, the extent to which those do predict their success in school and their achievement. So we do have that kind of outcome data, and so far, you know, it's been clear in the first two years that students that teachers rate high in self-regulation are also kids who are doing pretty well in terms of, and we look at not, like success in school encompasses their academic achievement, but also um, their just adjustment to school. So are they being successful in terms of making friendships and learning how to navigate or negotiate the, the classroom context and so on? So I guess we do have a little bit of um, that data. Um, but uh, yeah, no, the, the funders, that wasn't a comment that the reviewers made. Hi, I'm Karen Skilling from King's College London. Um, I've done a little bit of work around the transition between primary to secondary school, both in Australia and here in the UK. So I'm interested, um, for example, some of the teachers I've spoken to in, um, about early secondary students seem to have quite different views about whether students are capable of self-regulating and developing autonomous, autonomy type strategies practices and choices. And some really believe that this is something they should be promoting um, from the get-go once their children arrive in secondary school. And others believe that that's something that only a mature, quite able child is capable of doing. And it's quite interesting that the teachers seem to sit on one side of the fence. I'm, I'm wondering whether you're going to be able to pursue some of your studies further into secondary, maybe you don't have the same transition type issues in Canada, um, and clearly usually dips in learning, um, and all the other things that come to bear with that transition. So I just wondering if you could, would you like to follow them through? And do you have a comment to make about um, how teachers might, because you talk about teacher rating, I guess I'm talking about teachers' perceptions of how they see students, like whether they're able to so yeah. Well, interesting because I think when I started this work, that was something that struck me as well. I mean, you look at what these teachers in, uh, you know, Heather was doing with her grade two, three kids in terms of the inquiry project and so on. And I've been struck over and over again about the kinds of complex, um, sophisticated kinds of activities that some of these primary, we call them primary to grade. Yeah three, so wow. elementary through, uh, but that they have kids engaged in that you, that would be very, I bet if you shared those things with uh, secondary teachers, they would be quite um, surprised. Um, yes, is the answer, the <laughs> short answer to your question. It'd be wonderful to follow these kids right through secondary. I have had some experience myself working with um, secondary and the changing results for young readers. Some of our secondary teachers said, why do they get all the, <laughs> why do they get to be part of learning teams? What about adolescents who are struggling with reading? And so I was able to facilitate myself, the first team of secondary teachers, and we called it changing results for adolescent readers, um, and we had a focus on self-regulation. Now, for that first team, you can imagine I was speaking to the choir kind of thing. But the hope in those kinds of activities is that those teachers are ambassadors as they go back to their schools, having had that experience and trying out some things. Um, and it was true that the first year we had one team of adolescent, and in the next year we had 24. So that did spread um, through the province. But I think, I don't know that it's just a secondary elementary thing. I think that I've experienced similarly in elementary um, grades teachers that perceive that young children are not capable of these kinds of, of things and so they don't try it with them. Or the notion is, you know, and we have to acknowledge that there are always going to be groups of children or individual children who will struggle with self-regulated learning. But the good news is, and I guess what we have to emphasize, is that it is malleable and so, um, you know, everybody can improve. We have to have that, I don't know whether growth mindset is another thing that, so trying to kind of push that growth mindset, yeah, but it is a challenge. 
a study that I wanted to do that we didn't get funded because I think the transition you talk about is really um, key and uh, we, we called the, the one part of the title of the grant was uh, Lost in Transition, um, a play on the movie Lost yeah, in yeah. Translation. <laughs> um, but so why is it that you know some children kind of falter when they get into that context and almost always if you ask teachers what they're struggling with it's not even the academics that they're most concerned with. It's the organizational skills and the getting homework done and all of those kinds of things. So um, I would love to be able to do a study in a high school setting and watch those kids come in and focus on those kids that are floundering and see what happens if they have support um, for self-regulation as they move through that system. Yeah. My name is Adam Humlan from uh, UCL uh, Institute of Education, London. Uh, I have two questions. One is uh, self-regulated learning. Uh, uh, it's, in my understanding, it's kind of you give liberty and freedom to learners to explore things. So where do you uh, place the content of education, like curriculum for education? How do you, uh, how can we ensure that everybody can uh, get a certain minimum level of the uh, outcomes or the understanding in terms of curriculum? And second one is about, uh, in terms of the technology in education, there is a lot of uh, self-regulated learning being taught in technology in education. So, have you also come across or used any sort of or want to use technology in education to promote this self-regulated learning? Do you, how do you visualize technology for that? Okay. Um, well, the second, the answer to the second question is really easy. I'll just refer you to my husband, Phil Winnie, who <laughs> uses <laughs> uses technology to support um, self-regulated learning and a big time. A big time. <laughs> and I think I think it's great. Um, I'm not, and I do, I mean, we've been using t technological tools, but it's not a particular passion of mine to really get in there and wrestle with uh, the role of technology and all those things. I'll leave that to uh, Phil <laughs> and others. Um, the answer to your first question, um, I guess, is just to kind of caution against a conception of self-regulated learning that has that gives kind of total authority uh, to learners. I think, you know, there always will be curriculum and kind of learning goals. Um, the idea is how is it that um, self-regulated learning frameworks support students to achieve both personal goals and there are sometimes others um, goals. And in fact, sometimes we have to be most self-regulating in context when the goals are not our goals but someone else's goals um, because we have to persist and resist distractions and sometimes we have to bring um, strategies to those things to solve problems or cope with you know frustration or anxiety or those kinds of things so um, I think you know there's definitely and and also you can't be self-regulating in a vacuum you have to be self-regulating about something so when we're self-regulating for learning, um, usually we're doing that in the context of some curriculum or, you know, even if, but I, ideally, students even in those kind of, you know, there are things that we need to have them learn. Is there a way in which we can help them to pursue their own goals in that context? Or you think about the example of the bog, um, even if children maybe wouldn't be very interested in science or studying about ecosystems, most of those children got invested because it was the bog in their neighborhood. And uh, in fact, at the end of the school year, the bog caught on fire and was on fire for a couple of weeks. And those children became quite concerned about the implications, you know, for the life in the bog and, and all of those kinds of things. So, um, yeah. So I think, you know, the two kind of go together. Thank 
Courtney Froelig. I'm a PhD student in the Psychology and Education Group. And um, you mentioned that it seems easier when there's already a group with a certain initiative in place, and so it's easier to sort of work with that kind of a group. Do you have any suggestions or things that you've learned that you might do differently in the other context when you are approaching schools or teachers and um, any specific examples? Um, well, of course, it's not a good necessarily a good research uh, tool, but I think the idea of choice, um, you know, even for teachers, they need to have this sense of autonomy. And so um, kind of forcing them into it, I don't think works as well as if you can use a more ground up, grassroots kind of thing where those that are interested mm -hmm. kind of come on board and as others here, they can, they can join. Um, I think is a more powerful model for getting buy-in and also getting kind of commitment mm -hmm. and probably um, the sustainability. I mean, the problem with having teachers do something, I think those of us that have worked with teachers, if they don't believe in it or, I mean, when the learning team's finished and I walk away, chances are nothing more is going to happen in the classroom. So somehow you have to have that initial amount of uh, investment. But I guess, you know, having them come um, in the first instance, it's almost like if you know the motivation literature and there is work on triggering an interest, you know, so you, there will be those teachers that have kind of a well-developed interest in self-regulated learning, but there may be others who just by virtue of getting involved with the learning team and hearing about something that they haven't or trying something in a supportive kind of context. I think that's the other key, is that it's not just me coming today and then I'm walking away and you're left, you're kind of on your own to try things. Um, the, the value of the learning team or the collaborative inquiry approach is that teachers are, it's a recursive kind of thing and teachers are in a situation where they're getting guided and sustained support. And I think they're more likely to be involved in that and uh, to develop through that um, than they are with other kinds of professional learning initiatives. So, a few things. <laughs> One last question. Hi, I'm Nikki Hassan. I'm a PhD student here in the faculty. Thank you. I really enjoyed your talk. Um, I was just interested in your teacher learning teams, which I thought was brilliant, and having the teachers as co-researchers. And I wondered if you'd had any experience with using the children as co-researchers, particularly I was thinking the music project, were they aware that they were taking part in a research project? And if so, do you think that had any impacts on what worked? Yeah. Um, that's the the, uh, if you're familiar with photo elicitation as a, uh, an approach or a methodology, it's often used with kind of marginalized groups, but also to empower um, those groups so that they feel like they have a, their voice is heard. And so definitely those children, we told them, they know that we're the researchers and we're doing this thing and that we need them to help us collect. So we told them they were helping us to collect data. Um, and so that was very much part of the narrative or the interaction um, with them. Um, and I do think it may, I mean, that and having the cameras <laughs> and being able to work on the iPads, that yeah. was probably incentive too, so there may be a little bit of confounding there. But I do think it kind of empowers them to, and they feel like they are having a voice, we're asking them rather than asking them to rate on a scale of one to seven how they feel about a particular thing. We're actually getting in their own words um, how they feel about the, and then we match it to the scale of one to seven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Nancy. That's been such an inspiring and interesting. Well, thank you. You're such a warm and receptive uh, audience. It's lovely so to present. Thank you, Nancy.